Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 26, 2018, and this is the Weekend Charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and we'll get that. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep your questions to the topic at hand, and we should have plenty of time this week. Towards the end of the presentation, you can start asking questions in general, and that's just to help out my ADD a little bit. And your favorite stock picks. Hold off on those to the end of the show. That's for your benefit to make sure we get to all of them. And if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. So what are we talking about? Well, this week I want to talk about timing the market. And this is based on a question that I received a couple of weeks ago. And I'm just getting around to getting to it. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. The question is from Linda. I do much better when I am dealing with one position that is moving. But when the whole market is moving and it's affecting all of my positions, it's so much harder. Well, yeah, Linda, it is hard. <laughs> So you're not the only one. Now, we're going to get to her question in just one second. Before we get to that, you have to remember that when the market begins to tank and you have stocks in your portfolio, you're going to feel stress, obviously. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what level of trader you are. We're still human and we still have a pulse. And you're going to feel this instinct to do something to stop the bleeding. Well, the problem with that is, is that is micromanagement. And micromanagement often pays over the short term. You get a little skittish with your portfolio because the market's a little iffy. You exit everything and then the market crashes and you feel like a genius. Well, the market has just taught you to never hold on to your winners and you're not gonna do well longer term. As I often say and often show, in webinars, I'll have a portfolio, mostly long or all completely long, and then the market will begin to tank a little bit. And, of course, as soon as it does, I'll start receiving emails. Hey, Dave, portfolio is getting hit fairly hard in here. I'm like, yeah, thanks for telling me. I, I, I was not aware of that. <laughs> and they want to bail out on everything, including the remaining winner, winner or winners in the portfolio. And not all the time, but every time, not every time, and not all the time, but sometimes that remaining winner or winners go on to be the biggest winners of the year. And I've shown this time and time again in these webinars. And that's the problem when you're playing a system or a methodology that requires an outlier for its performance. Now, trend following is the only way to make money. And trend following, unfortunately, does require the occasional outlier. So the problem is when the market begins to tank, if you exit everything, you risk, you risk losing money, or I'm, I'm sorry, you risk an opportunity cost of not making enough money. And if you don't make enough money on your big winners, you're not going to cover your lose. So that's completely normal when the market begins to tank to want to just bail out on everything, I would urge you to resist that urge. Now let's get to her question. Can you share any of your basic rules with me? Example, don't trade when the market is between the 50 and 280 moving averages. Just sit in your hands. Well, I don't have any hard and fast rules, but we are going to explore market timing in just one second. I wouldn't necessarily not trade when the market is trading between the 50 and 280 moving averages. I might be a little bit more selective, and I'll flesh that out in a few minutes. And any other suggestions? I was using the daily charts for my patterns and then using the 30 minute for my entries and exits from there. I am considering changing up and only making decisions after the close of the day rather than being swayed by the intraday decisions and my emotions. Okay. Be as close to the market 
as you need to be and no closer. If you are watching that intraday chart, you're going to be inclined to take more trades, possibly unnecessary trades, and possibly sucked into thinking that the market is making a much bigger move than it really is. Now, when I'm saying market right now, I'm referring to whatever market you have to be trading, whether stocks or some other market. So you got to be careful when you're looking at that micro and realize where you are within the macro. Now, a few weeks back in a webinar, I talked about trading Forex on a deficient market, such as Forex, using hourly charts off of major highs and major lows. And that's a completely different type of trading that I'm talking about. What I'm saying here is be careful if you're using those intraday charts for entries. What I would suggest you do for starters is possibly focus on the daily charts. Now, I know Linda is following uh, Charles Kirk also, so I'm not sure exactly what her methodology is. But let's say you're trading something Dave Landry style, like a pullback or a TKO, and this is a daily chart. You say, okay, my entry is going to be here. Well, if you watch a daily chart and it opens and it does this, it goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up. Well, if you're watching a daily chart, it's just going to look like a little blip in here. But if you're watching an intraday chart, it might look like this. And you might say, oh, I better jump in. It's really, really taken off. But on the daily chart, it might just be like a little tick and a little tick up like that. So that's the first thing I would do. The problem with making decisions after the close is that a market can make a very huge move intraday. Now, it doesn't happen that often, especially given the last few years of the market, even though the market has gone higher. It's not like it was in 1999 where I can remember one specific example where I recommended a stock and it had a – it just kind of barely went up to a trigger point above the prior day's high and then just kind of messed around a little bit intraday. And then by the end of the day, it was up 58 points, literally 58 points. It was like a $50 stock or a $40 stock. It wasn't, wasn't that high price of a stock given the nature of the move. So pretty much doubled intraday. Now, we won't see that many of those moves in present-day markets. But a market could make a substantial move intraday. So let's say you've got a nice little setup, a little pullback or something like this setting up. And you say, well, I'm going to wait for the close to see if it closes above this level. Well, it might hit that level and close way up here. And then... You're coming in at the end of the day, and now you're faced with a dilemma. Jeez, is it too high to get in, or what should I do? So I'm not saying don't enter intraday. What I'm saying is do enter intraday. What I am saying is be careful if you're watching the intraday charts, okay, because right here you end up with, these intraday decisions as opposed to your decision being calculated the day before, and then you decide to enter the following day. Also, regarding passive investing, what is your opinion about picking an ETF portfolio just adding to it every time it hits a 2 day moving average? Well, this assumes, without knowing anything else about what Linda is getting at, this assumes that the market will always come back. So you're saying, okay, well, you got an ETF. I'm going to add. I'm going to add. I'm going to add. The only problem with that is eventually this ETF or any asset class will lose at least 50% of its value. And the adage that I often quote is that all asset classes will lose half of their value sometime in your lifetime and as i often preach i haven't been at it this long i'm old but i'm not that old i'm getting older though <laughs> getting there but in my short trading career the last 20 30 years i've seen two really serious bear markets and if you go back to 1999 and then i guess the bear market started in 2000 march of 2000 
The NASDAQ lost 70% of its value. So never forget that. And the buy and hold people, oh, the market always comes back. Well, that'll work until it don't. And as this is an argument that I brought up before, and I noticed that Greg Morris has brought up the same argument in his book. I think it's he talked about it in Investing with the Trend, and he's also talked about it in his blogs and Twitter, etc. The problem with buy and hold is if you end up with that 50% loss of asset class right before you retire, that could change your lifestyle dramatically. Now, if you got $10 million, you might be able to get by on $5 million if your portfolio gets halved and you have to cash out to retire. But Greg's point, getting back to Greg, is that if you have a million dollars and then all you're left with is a half a million dollars right before retirement, then your lifestyle is going to change dramatically. So retiring on half of what you were counting on can be very difficult, both mentally and monetarily, obviously. I really think I'm looking to put together the simplest rules-based program that I could just say, if this, then this. I spent a lot of time on market, on market timing. I bought a book called The Encyclopedia of Technical Market Indicators, and I went through this entire book and studied everything in it, and I bought The Market Technician, which was a Metastock product, was available about 30 years ago. And I went through everything there. It's it's a was a market timing type of product that went back and looked at the last entire history of the of all these indices and had all these indicators going back many many years, sometimes a hundred years or more. And as I often say, I used to wake up very early in program systems. And one thing I learned from all this is market timing is tough. And the other thing I learned is that you could end up with analysis paralysis, as I'll touch upon in one second. I'm getting a little further ahead of myself than I intended to. But the bottom line is, yes, do keep it simple. And unfortunately, there's really not any hard and fast rules, at least that I've figured out when it comes to timing the market. So first of all, timing the market is tough. Just make no bones about it. Look at the returns of the average money manager and you'll see that 90-something percent of them can't beat the index itself. And that's why a lot of them, even though they claim they might be these market timers or these stock pickers, what they end up doing is they make their portfolio act a lot like the S&P 500 by buying just a certain basket of stocks that will help to mirror the performance. So... Trust me, market timing is not an easy thing to do. Now, before we get to my actual analysis of the indices and how I like to look at a few little indicators there and a few little tips and tricks, the first thing I like to do is get a feel for things versus any hard and fast rules. Now, the main thing I do is empirical research. That's a fancy way of saying I look at charts. My market analysis starts with a bottom-up approach. Now, I'm going to give you my approach here today, my exact approach. To actually see it in practice, it takes me at least about four hours to go through it. And when I did the stock selection webinar, the stock selection course, I should say, it ended up taking about 14 hours total, and I did the analysis a couple times. But if I'm speaking in person and we have an entire afternoon carved out, we'll just go through stocks. We'll look for setups, obviously, in the process. But in that process of looking for setups, we'll get a feel for what's going on in the overall market. Now, I've gotten the process down to about an hour a day, and I could probably will it down even further than that if I don't allow myself to get too distracted. I have a um, an hourglass on my on my desk. I guess I should call it a half hour glass. And my goal is to try to 
look at charts and only charts, no matter what emails come in, no matter what fires happen that seem to be wanting me to hurry up and put out, I try to get at least 30 minutes in. And in that 30 minutes, I could pretty much get all of my analysis done if I could stay focused. And I'm looking at two to 3,000 stocks. I run loose parameter scans, and a lot of times I look at the majority of my tradable universe. And I ask myself, are most going up, are most going down, or are most sideways and choppy? And this will give you a really good feel for the markets. Because a lot of times I'll be like, wow, everything's kind of going sideways in here. And then I'll look at the overall market. And it's like, oh, well, the market's going sideways for the last couple of weeks, couple of months, or whatever. Now, you let your database drive your, your trading. So if you're seeing tons and tons of great-looking setups, then you know it's time to trade. As, as I often say, if after you get your analysis done and you've got that, that watch list and you've got like 20 or 30 stocks and you just keep going through those 20 or 30 stocks over and over, and you're like, Man, I like I like at least five of these so much, I just can't decide between which ones to trade. That's a market that you should be trading. Conditions are probably pretty good. Even without doing the overall market analysis, you have tons of setups. You can't decide between them all. Then you know that it's time to trade. Other times, I find myself going through the database over and over and my momentum list and go back through the IPOs. If I find myself doing all that stuff and I can't find a setup to save my life or nothing I'm not really excited about, then it's probably not a good time to be trading. So that's sort of my ground up kind of um, in reverse order as opposed to a top down approach, kind of a bottom up approach to my market analysis. So when you are in that can't find a setup to save your life, at some point, I'm like, you know what? I got to stop this analysis. Now, if I wasn't putting out a trading service, then I probably would have stopped that analysis an hour earlier or whatever. But I feel like, let me just keep looking. Maybe I'll find something. And at some point, I'll, I'll tell myself, self, there's nothing there. One thing that I have found, usually within 10 minutes, I can find something. If I can't find something within 10 minutes, there's probably nothing there, okay? So I'd be willing to bet that if you set a timer for 10 minutes and said, Dave, find me a setup, I could find a setup within 10 minutes. And if I didn't, it's probably not a market worth trading. Now, I still dot my I's and cross my T's and go through everything else. But I'm just saying that something should jump out at you fairly quickly when conditions are good. The other thing you want to pay attention to, and again, this is just kind of a thumbnail of the daily analysis, and we'll get into the market, overall market analysis in just a minute, but just understand the daily analysis that goes in, and that's just simply looking at a lot of charts. And again, this is exactly what I'm doing every day. You could do it completely on your own, create your tradable universe, use about 250000 on 30-day average volume, and just go through those charts. I like to sort them by 50-day HV. I can give you the formulas for for all of this, actually. And then I run some simple scans on everything, and doing all that gives me a pretty good feel for things. But in going through all these stocks, are there some debacle du jour? In other words, are there stocks getting torpedoed? Is it just one or two? Is it quite a bit? If you start seeing a whole lot of stocks getting hit hard, then you might say, hmm, I might want to pull my horns in just a little bit. And then I like to look at several hundred sectors and selected ETFs. So I'm looking at thousands of stocks and I got a pretty good feel for what's going on. And I might see, I'll just pull a random sector out there, biotechs. I might have five biotechs that look pretty damn good that I might want to trade. And I certainly want to dig a little deeper to do a little bit more analysis on those and maybe even go through the entire sector to see if there's any sexy brothers or sisters that I may have overlooked. So it's a game of clues. And I'm going through all these stocks and it's kind of directing me where I should look or telling me stop looking. OK. But after doing that, I'll look at the biotech sector itself and every other sector for that matter 
and say, aha, I see that I've got some setup stacks stack, stacking up, easy for me to say, in biotech. So let's take a look at biotech, and that looks pretty good. And then, again, we'll go through all these other sectors to see what's, what's happening overall. And you have to ask yourself, are they going up mostly, or are they going down mostly, or, or are they going sideways? And, of course, where is the leadership? Is it big cap stocks? Is it small cap stocks? Is it commodity-related stocks, such as the energies, or is it the metals? And is it, or are you seeing a lot of IPOs, possibly, that are setting up? Are most of the IPOs, the more liquid IPOs, I should say, I sort my IPOs by three-day average volume. And that's how I look at the IPOs, because I want to see the more liquid ones first. Are most of them going up, or are they mixed? But is it the only place you could find a setup? And I'll tell you where I'm going with that. Is So you're going through IPOs, and yeah, most of them are kind of like the the die and die. They come public, and they just start dying right away, as I often discuss. In other words, for those of you who are not familiar with the IPO stuff that I do, let's say stock comes public here, and you're seeing IPO after IPO that looks like that. Well, that tells you that the appetite for speculative stocks isn't fantastic. So that gives you a clue. But if it's the only place you can find a setup, then you get this, I guess, dichotomy is the word I'm looking for, where you have these ones that are just really obvious and dying, but then you have a few great setups. Sometimes when a market gets a little iffy, the speculative area still is working to some extent. Now, what I'm trying to say is that you'll still see some really great look at setups in something like IPOs, but virtually nothing else. But if all the IPOs are headed higher too, that just means that there's tons of money flowing into the market. Now, once I have a good feel for things, and what I do is I, again, Tradable Universe, run a loose scan, and look at most of the stocks from that scan, which sometimes it'll produce about somewhere between, let's say, 1,100 and 1,500 stocks. It's not much of a scan, right? But I want to see what stocks made a recent new high. In other words, have or in the process of pulling back. And then I keep a momentum list. Each day I come up with what I call, what I call the Landry list, and that's like a short list of stocks to look at, both long and short stocks. Not not short, just short stocks, but a list of stocks to look at the next day. And from that, I will it down to a setup. But the recent Landry list, stocks that have recently made the Landry list, or stocks that are trending that catch my eye, I also keep in a separate momentum list. And that momentum list right now, it's got about 100 stocks in it. So in going through my momentum list, my IPO list, and then stocks in general, and then my loose parameter scans, I get a pretty good feel for things, and if I'm seeing a lot of stocks begin to implode, not just necessarily getting torpedoed, but just beginning to implode a little bit, especially in that momentum list. And by the way, the problem with momentum trading, and if I could ever solve for this, you'll never see my fat ass again, but the problem with momentum trading is it can it can end badly. So you'll you'll print money, and then all of a sudden the list will get whacked pretty hard. Your list of momentum stocks you'll find will get whacked pretty hard. Now, let's get into the analysis of the indices. So I would encourage you to keep it simple. As I said a minute ago, you have to be careful of that siren call of multiple indicator analysis, which could lead to paralysis. So tread lightly. Now, I'm a big fan of Greg Morris and Linda in her follow-up email, which I received, I think, yesterday, was asking what I thought about Greg Morris's market timing indicators. Well, keep in mind that Greg is more of a, of a big picture type of guy. He, he comes from fund management where he was managing $5 billion, and they weren't picking individual stocks. They were trading ETFs. So a lot of his market analysis was done – not by looking at a couple thousand stocks every day, but looking at some indicator which would tell him how many stocks are going up or how many stocks are going down or some sort of advanced decline analysis 
along those lines. And he's done a lot of research along those lines. And, and I, I'm sure it's all good stuff. If it comes from Greg, it's good stuff. That's pretty much my litmus test there. But for me, I, I prefer I prefer the empirical approach, as we just discussed, and then some very simple little things when it comes to the indices in and of themselves, paying mostly most attention to the price action and I sprinkle in a few little indicators. So price, first and foremost, is the number one thing, but getting a feel for what's going on internally can help tremendously. Now, keep in mind, as I preach, technical analysis leads the way, but it doesn't have to be that technical. The first thing you want to do when you're looking at any market, and market could be an index, a sector, an ETF, Bitcoin, or anything else, you want to look at the net-net and just ask yourself, is the market higher, lower, or about the same as it was? Now, in spite of me preaching that and everybody's eyes glazing over every time I say it, I'm still going to get questions about trend trading a market that's in absolutely no trend or worse, is in an obvious downtrend based on the net net price movement. And we'll take a look at that in just one second. So when we're looking at these indices, this is I focus mostly on the S&P, the NASDAQ and the Russell Excuse me, I had to sneeze. When looking at the indices, I focus on the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Russell 2000. Occasionally, I might look at something else, but for the most part, I'm looking at those indices. So the first thing, again, is the net-net. Another thing I like to look at is how far away from new highs is it? And I just was thinking this morning, how do I illustrate that in a chart so I... The uh, computer scientist that still lives deep inside of me programmed a little indicator. And then I found myself beginning to play with it and, <laughs> and think, Dave, don't go down that road of analysis, paralysis and all this. Just continue to keep it simple. And as I often preach, although there's quite a bit of lag in moving averages, the slope and the daylight can be quite telling. And then my bow tie moving averages proper order can also be quite useful. Now, just real quick for those who don't know what the bow ties are, 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential, and that's it. And that could be a daily time frame, that could be an intraday time frame on hourly or five minute or a weekly time frame. As I discussed in recent presentations, patterns or fractal. So let's talk about the net net price change. And this is a chart we talked about a week or two ago in the Russell 2000. So you can see it hasn't gone anywhere on a net net basis in some time. And this might be yesterday's chart actually. But you can see today's it's 726 for reference. 18. So yeah, yesterday it bounced back a little bit, but it had this big outside day down. But if you just look at the net net price change, you could see we had how many weeks? We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost eight weeks of sideways trading. So we know that this market has lost a little steam. Not the end of the world, but it's like, okay, it's going a little sideways. If we look a little longer term, though, we could see that, okay, what's had a pretty good move from these recent lows in here? So this tells us that, well, maybe the longer term trend is still up, even though it's kind of consolidating in here. And then if we look at the Dave light, I'm sorry, before we look at the Dave light, if we look at the slope of the moving average, you'll see that, okay, the positive, there's positive slope of the moving average, and this is just a 50 simple. I often look at the 50 simple in the overall market because it is a well-watched moving average. And then there's also Dave light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. 
So shorter term, it's lost momentum. Somewhat longer term, it's doing okay because there's Dave Light. And then also, one thing that I didn't point out in my slides is it's not too far from all-time highs. One or two big up days or one really big afternoon, and you'll be back to new highs. And I'll talk about those in just one second. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate the uh, moving averages when we get to them. Good question. Okay, now, as I've discussed recently, in early 2018, I began working with Metastock, and they in May of 2018, they released my indicators. It's not that many indicators, but uh, because obviously I don't use that many, but they were re released with few indicators I have, and they also created expert advisors for my patterns, such as bow ties and TKOs and things like that. And one thing that I pointed out after playing around with the little indicators is that you can't have a bear market without downside daylight. And by that, I mean, if you're looking at like a weekly chart, just so you don't get too caught up in a day to day, when the market is less than the when the high I'm sorry the high of the market is less than the 50 week moving average then you might want to be a little cautious and as long as there's upside daylight meaning that the lows of the market are greater than the moving average then not that it's necessarily at all clear a green light red light as I have suggested here or implying but at least you know that the market has generally gone up so as I've showed this slide quite a bit, and this is updated as of yesterday, you could see that in the late 90s, when we had that great up run, you had almost entire, or that period, I should say, was entirely green. In other words, you had upside daylight, and only one or two tiny little bars you squish your eyes below the moving average. Fast forward to 2000 when the NASDAQ lost 70% of its value, as I just discussed. S&P lost over half of its value. You had no upside daylight, meaning there was no green. And then as you can see, subsequent bear markets and bull markets throughout were mostly green or mostly red. Now, there were some corrections along the way. And in 2015, 2016, you did begin to see a little bit of downside Dave light on the 50-week chart. On the Russell 2000 from a weekly bow tie, and we're going to talk about weekly bow ties in just one second, the Russell did drop about 18% from that sell-off. So if you were long stocks and you were honoring your stops, you probably would have got stopped out of your stocks. And it, like we did, we did get stopped out, unfortunately. But fortunately, we started shorting, and we made a little bit of money on the short side. Not enough to brag about because the bear market didn't ensue. But the market sold off enough for us to be cautious and listen to the database and take a few sell signals. Now, since then, as you can see, we've been mostly green, and we'll zoom it in and take a look at the current period. So here's where we are now. And you could see that we did get fairly high based on the count of daylight. This is not magnitude, okay? Each day is plus one as long as you're above the, the market. So right here would be zero. This would be zero. You could see it intersects. At zero, and you have no, you don't have upside daylight, but you also don't have downside daylight. And then you can see back here, this red we were beginning to get back in 2015, 2016. This is where you might want to be a little cautious. You don't want to go crazy bearish, but you might want to think about honoring your stops, and you might want to become a little selective on the long side, or maybe a lot selective on the long side. But as you can see, as I've said in prior presentations, not that you want to time the market, but when this indicator starts pushing towards about 100 days, or in this particular case, 100 weeks, so let's just keep it simple. And this is a weekly chart. See this little W down here? I don't know if you can see it in your charts. But on a weekly basis, when you start pushing about 100, 
from what I've seen, it looks like the market is due to correct. Not that you would time it on that, but you might want to, again, make sure you're honoring your stops. And then back here, we did get stopped out of everything. Okay. And that's okay. And then you can see after a little kiss of the moving average, now we're climbing back up again. So, so far, this leg that started, let's just say it started back in 2016, you've had nearly all upside Dave light and no downside Dave light. Now, keep in mind, with any indicator, there will be lag. But the good news is if you're using stops on your individual issues, you'll, get, you'll start getting stopped out. And by the way, kind of backing into something here by accident, that's another litmus test too, especially if you're a momentum trend follower and you start get, your portfolio still starts getting hit, but the market is still making new highs on a marginal basis, then that could be a clue, one of many clues, but that could be a clue that, hey, the market is losing some steam in here. And again, as you can see, the big blue arrow is pointed higher for quite some time. And that's a little kiss, and you can see right there on the chart where the count resets back to zero. Somebody asked me about cumulative count. I think it was Craig a few weeks back or a few months back. And that would just say, like, okay, well, we're not going to reset it. We're just going to keep a cumulative count. The only problem with that is I think it could get complicated really quick. And I just kind of eyeball and said, okay, well, way up here. And, yeah, I could see that we were kind of green and we didn't have any red. So I know the market is extra overbought. But I think it's kind of dangerous to come up with some sort of cumulative indicator because what's going to happen is it could probably end up like in the thousands because if you look back, you take the red out, which isn't as much, which on a, on a period-wise, there's not as much. The market doesn't go down as much as it goes up. So I think you're going to end up with a lopsided indicator. So I just like to keep it simple and know how many days the lows have been above the moving average. So when the market is not too far from all-time highs and when there is weekly upside Dave light, you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. So what do I mean by that? Well, recently we had... A couple of shorts show up, but I decided based on the market action overall, let's just hold off on putting any shorts on. And one of them, Interactive Brokers, really sold off nicely, but that's okay. It just wasn't worth fighting the overall trend or it wasn't worth swimming against the tide is the way I felt about that. Now, if we had downside Dave Light, and the moving averages are rolling over, the bow tie moving averages are rolling over, or if we have a weekly sell signal with the bow ties, which we'll talk about in one second, and then I was like, you know what, guys, let's go ahead and start putting a short or two on and see what happens. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, you want to give the market the benefit of the doubt when it's not too far away from new highs. Keep the questions coming. We're going we're gonna to get to those, I promise. Now, this is something I played with this morning. And I wrote a simple little indicator, which I wrote it in Metastock, but you could probably translate it to any other package. And I often say if the market isn't too far away from all-time highs, then err on the side of the longer-term trend. So a few days ago, the S&P 500 was percent and change, I think, away from all-time highs. So that's where you kind of give it the benefit of the doubt. So all this is, is this is how far away on a percentage basis is the market away from its all-time highs. So you could see earlier this year, the market on a closing basis was about 10% away from its all-time high. So it's like, okay, well, maybe I'm not as excited about being long this market. Now, longer-term indicators are still pointing up at this juncture. But you certainly don't want to rush out and buy a bunch of stocks unless you really, really like the setup, which we're going to come back to in just one second. 
Now, notice during this nice big uptrend we had here that the market was fairly close, and it seems like 5% is a pretty good number, just from a little poking around this morning. But you can see it stayed green during this entire uptrend. I'm sorry, during this entire uptrend, it stayed, this green period, it stayed below 5% away from the all-time highs. Now, in this particular case, I programmed this indicator at, it's just 250, so this is a one-year high. And then I did experiment with other numbers. If you're just looking at the charts, which I normally do, and I don't plot this indicator, especially since I just created it 30 minutes ago, but even though I have this indicator, which I might play with here and there, I'd prefer to just kind of eyeball a chart and say, oh, okay, well, yeah, right here, let me back this out. Yeah, right here, I can see we're, uh, yeah, we're just a smidge off of all-time highs. We've got nice little daylight. The slope of the moving average is higher. And if you actually measured it, you can see zero would mean brand new highs and just little every little tick out would be just a little bit off all-time highs. Then it's like, okay, well, let's just give the market the benefit of the doubt and stay long. Now, when the market begins to tank, obviously there's going to be some lag in all this, okay? Any indicator is going to have lag, but that's okay because we're using stops and we'll start getting stopped out, as we did earlier this year. And as I preach, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, just like Linda was saying earlier, like, oh, geez, I hate when I start losing money, when all my stocks and portfolios start going down, when the market starts tanking. Well, welcome to the club. It, pronounced with a silent SH, happens. I guess I need to go back to PG-13. YouTube's been demonetizing my videos because I've been dropping <laughs> a few little uh, low-level curse words. But anyway, this is just kind of something to play with. And again, you know me, I just tend to eyeball these things. But all of this tells me up top is a percent away from all-time highs. How far is the market away from all-time highs? And if it's less than 5%, give the market the benefit of the doubt as a general rule. Now, Linda was asking for a, a little bit more of a hard and fast rule, a little more if-then. This would just be kind of a general guideline, okay? Because unfortunately, markets don't move on exacts. Why don't they move on exact? Well, if they did, there wouldn't be a market. As Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, if markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. The reason markets, the reason you could trade is because of the emotions of others and because the market is imperfect. Provided, of course, you can embrace your own emotions as I often preach. So that's why the market isn't perfect. If, it's, if it was perfect, then somebody would have had figured it out and it wouldn't be a market. The market is imperfect because there's a disagreement or a disequilibrium in price. And our job is to figure out what that disequilibrium in price is and more importantly, figure out what the trend is. But again, as you can see, during this entire up period, the market stayed within 5% of its all-time highs. Now, I know this is rocket science, but sometimes it's kind of fun to look at these things and think about it. Now, if we look longer term, you can see, obviously, when the bear markets happen, and again, this is just a 250-day high, which is roughly one year's worth of trading, 250 trading days. You can see, as long as it's kind of bouncing around below 5% away from its new highs, the market's in pretty good shape. But when it begins to sell off, obviously you get above 5%. And then you can see that the market's further and further away from its all-time highs. And one thing I'm, I'm looking at here is like, oh, well, well, Dave, let's work on peaks and troughs. And if this is falling, then maybe we should be buying stocks. And it's like, well, that, again, you got to be careful because you start getting things, making things more and more complex. But, yeah, as you can see, when you are getting stretched away, from the prior highs and the market sold off pretty hard, then yeah, it could be due to bottom, but that doesn't mean that you want to go in and buy the market. So I don't have the NASDAQ plotted, but I would guess if you went in and plotted the NASDAQ when it was down 50%, this would look a lot like that, but then it went down another 30% from there. And 
I think it was, I forget the exact number, but I know it was down 70% total. I, I don't know what you add to 30 to 50 to make the 70%, the way the percentages work. But anyway, when it was down 50%, it looked like a bargain, and then it dropped another 20%. So be careful with this kind of peak trough analysis. But you could say, okay, well, this thing's pretty oversold in here. Maybe I want to honor my stops on my shorts, and I want to be maybe a little bit more selective than putting on any new shorts. And then again, take a look at when it's less than 5% away from the, in this case, one-year highs, but I would also look at all-time highs. And you can see the market's generally doing pretty good when that happens. And then this is that 2015-16 sell-off I talked about. Well, notice the market's starting to pull away from those prior highs, and that's when you pull your horns in a little bit. Now, let's talk about bow tie proper order. Now, bear with me, guys, for those of you who know the bow ties. Somebody's asking me, it says, uh, one more time in those MAs, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. Yes, that is correct. 20 exponential, 20 EMA, and then 30 EMA, okay, is what I'm using. So we're going to look at the slope of the moving averages, okay, meaning are they going higher or are they going lower or are they just kind of doing this, okay? And we're also going to look, we're not going to focus as much on day light, but we'll look at the daylight there. And you can see, for instance, here's your 30-day exponential moving average. And you had a pretty good trend here. And you only had a couple of days of day light during that entire trend that led us up to the slide we saw earlier this year. But the other thing you want to look at with the bow ties is are you getting sell signals off of major highs, okay? And that's something you want to pay attention to when it occurs. And are you getting buy signals off of major lows? Now, I'm not as excited about a bow tie when the market's kind of chopping around in a range like this. But if it's coming off a major high or major low, I want to pay attention. So getting back to those major highs and lows on the sell signals, before the last two bear markets, we had major sells. We did have a major sell in 2015, as I've been saying. And we got a bit of a sell-off from that, a bit of a whip lash back, I should say, or a bigger, bit of a throwback move back towards old highs before it sold off again. And that's where... The as I mentioned earlier, the Russell sold off 18% from the signal. And here's your major buys coming off of decade lows or decade plus lows. And then, as I often say, this one was a little late, but you had plenty of daily signals coming in. So that's a few things that you are when you do your market analysis, and that's pretty much it. The bottom line is if you do the empirical research, you're gonna go a long ways. To learning. Hey, Kamada, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, Dave Light is in the latest version of Metastock. And that's the indicator, that little magnitude indicator, that's the indicator that I had them program for me. And you know me, I like to keep things simple. Good to see you uh, again. So you've been, you're still trading? That's cool. Now, once you do your analysis, and let's say the market's a little questionable, you're seeing a lot of debacle is yours. We got downside Dave light. The moving averages have turned down. And by the way, let me show you something that my buddy Greg taught me. With a simple moving average, and I think I discussed this in the first four videos of Trading Full Circle, and if you haven't watched those, which you can get for free, Make sure you do that. But a simple moving average, the market may drop below it, and that simple moving average might have so much lag that it, it ends up turning way over here. With an exponential moving average, the day the market closes below the moving average, that moving average will turn down. Okay. Now, it's going to be less dramatic in a longer-term moving average. You're going to have to squint your eyes, but it will turn down. 
And this is why, again, a lot of things I find empirically and don't even understand, but it's like, wow, that works pretty cool. And later I found out, find out why it actually works. Well, that's because the bow tie works pretty good because the 10 day simple is pretty shorter term and it will turn fairly quickly, but those exponential moving averages are turning even quicker. And the relationship between those three, I kind of messed it up, but the relationship between those three helps that bow tie to form. And those bow tie exponential moving averages in the bow tie will catch up the price a little bit quicker. And if you, you guys remember in a recent webinar, somebody was asking me a bunch of questions about bow ties. And in one of their charts, the moving averages, let's see, let's try it again. In one of their charts, the moving averages look like this. If I can draw it. The moving averages look like that. And then like that. And then let me try it up here. Like this and like this and like this. It's like you could see that there was this tremendous lag in them all. So what had happened was he was using all simple moving averages as opposed to those two exponential moving averages. Now, this is a slide I talked about a while back, and it's kind of a, a Tim Ferriss type of binary decision thing. Have you weighed all of the above with the potential choice of not taking any new action? I like the way Tim Ferriss talks about making decisions and analyzing not making decisions or avoiding something or saying no to something. And in his books, he talks a lot about the F yeah. If you're not feeling the F yeah on a setup, then you should pass. Okay. And this comes from the checklist on trading presentation that I did a while back. But you really need to feel that excitement when it comes to doing something, when it comes to a potential opportunity. If you're not feeling that, then you need to pass. Now, here's a decision tree I often talk about. First question is, are conditions generally conducive? So what does that mean? That means that the sectors or most sectors are headed higher, most stocks are headed higher, most... Stocks within the sectors are headed higher, so things are looking pretty good. You're drawing a lot of big blue arrows on your chart, then it's a no-brainer. You trade. Now, if things are a little bit more questionable and you're seeing a lot of stocks that look like electrocardiograms, a lot of sectors that look like electrocardiograms, maybe the overall market has chopped sideways for weeks, months, or longer, then... You really, really need to take that F yeah test. Do you think you have the mother of all setups? Now, that could be a small cap stock that just looks fantastic, an IPO that looks fantastic, even though the representative sector is not doing so great and the overall market, again, is not doing so great. And it could also be maybe a commodity-related stock that could trade contra to the overall market, provided, of course, the commodity, such as oil or metals, provided that the commodity is also trending or at the least making a change in trend. In other words, an emerging trend, let's say gold is beginning to bow tie, the metals are beginning to bow tie, then maybe you want to take a look at some of those gold stocks or metal and mining stocks. Now, again, if you don't think you have the mother of all setups, then you need to walk away, but B, Okay. It's very hard, especially during less than ideal conditions, to look at a setup and say, that looks that looks okay, but the market's not that great and the setup's not that great. I'm just going to pass. And then you see it take off without you. The problem there is in freshman psychology and freshman trading psychology is going to rear its ugly head is that there's always a danger of selective perception. So you're thinking of that one little setup that really took off without you, but you forget about the 
hundred other stocks, and if you'd have taken all those other mediocre setups, how much money you would have lost on all those? So be very careful in that selective perception. All right, any questions on anything we've covered so far? And then while I just go through this real quick, we'll open it up for individual questions on anything else, too. Um, as I've been saying quite a bit, my deadline has about uh, 12, well, actually 11 hours and 18 minutes, 18 hours. Let me start over. My deadline for this has 11 days, 18 hours, and 48 minutes and one second. But that's not going to happen. When I started going through the courses, I realized I wanted to add more and more. And that's one of the things I recently read about and lit or saw a video on in this membership course that I'm taking on how to do all this is that the biggest problem people have is that they build and build and build and build. <laughs> so uh, guilty as charged, but there's so much I don't want to put into this. And I want to make sure it's it's not going to be perfect, but somewhat perfect before I get into it. But anyway, there's trading courses. Obviously, these premium courses are up here. And then the member course is going to be down here. And it's just growing and growing and growing by leaps and bounds. And there's so much more I want to put into it. And as you get into it, you will you can see your progress will be over here. And it's a really cool thing. And this is what's called a learning management system. And I'm pretty excited about it. Now, I'm a nerd, but I can track the progress, and you can track your progress and see how you're doing. So if you really want to get better at your trading, then you have a concrete way of making sure that you've got the information down and understand the information by taking the quizzes and getting through the topics and the lessons so you have a full grasp of what you're doing. What amazes me about trading is how people will lose thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars without having any idea what they're doing. Now, it's not my way or highway, but if you're trying to follow something trend following similar to mine or trying to follow what I'm doing directly, then you need to get educated, okay? And as I've told the story ad nauseum, some guy emails me for 10 years, and finally I'm thinking, this guy is mentally challenged. And I'm like, you know, just can you go read reread my first book? Oh, I've been meaning to get that. It's like, oh, okay. So this whole time you're just asking me a bunch of questions and you haven't put in, put in any time? Now, I'm not saying that to be a jerk, but I'm saying it to – make the point that you have to invest a little bit of your time to get educated. And also on this, this would be pretty cool. I added a new feature. Again, like I said, I keep adding more and more things. But what's going to happen is when you first log in the system, you're going to be asked to set your trading goals. And then every time you log in, you're going to see those trading goals on various pages. So they're going to be staring you at the face. So, Let's say your goal is to pick the best, leave the rest, trade trends, trade your plan, plan your trade, I should say, and trade your plan. And you find yourself winging it on a trade or you find yourself not planning that trade ahead of time, either or, or both, or not following your plan or fighting a trend and not exiting even though the trend has gone way past your stop. Then every time you log in, you're going to see that staring you at, in the face. And I think that one little thing in and of itself is going to help. If you write something down, you're more likely to remember it and much more likely to actually act on that action. Just a couple more things real quick, and we'll hop into individual charts. The uh, 911 calls, what's going to happen is there's going to be a bonus for the longer you stay in the system and the more you get through, and you'll get uh, 911 calls. So you can call me up. If you click here, you'll get my cell phone or whatever form of contact that I currently have for you. So you can get instant access. If you get in a little bit of a bind, you can give me a holler. And then also, in time, you can unlock consulting time, one-on-one -on -one time. But the bottom line is you will have to go through some courses and get educated first. So your time will be highest and best spent. And then, as I said again a minute ago, the bonus content is – as you go through the courses, and the longer you stay a member, the more and more content you'll get. Okay. So Dave says, 
Is it useful to look at bow ties for shorter time frames, for example, in addition to weekly? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we were talking about trading more efficient markets like Forex in the last week of charts, which I think was two or three weeks ago, between the holidays and things in my personal life and business and markets, I haven't been keeping up, as you know, with the weekend charts every week. But if you go back, oh, I think it's two weeks. Just the last one. Well, it's actually on my homepage right now on my website. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in that presentation, I showed where the big sell-off we had in the S&P this year came off an hourly bow tie off of all-time high. So without giving you the entire presentation, go in and watch that week of charts on Forex, and then you'll see what I mean. Um, if you go to daylater.com, it's a stupid Earl, I know, 2 trade doc successfully. You can watch the first four videos in Trading Full Circle. And I talk a lot about things such as the, the lag and the moving averages and the exponential moving averages and net-net, et cetera, and the fact that the markets don't always go up longer term. All right, let's hop out to the live charts, and you can keep the questions coming if you want. Let me go through current conditions real quick, although we did a little bit of that already. And then what I want to do is uh, obviously get to your stock picks. So just start asking about individual stocks. I'll be happy to cover them. Before we do that, let's take a look at the overall market real quick. One thing I noticed this morning, on a rolling basis, which I used to be a fan, or I was always a fan of the rolling charts. Oh, it's corrected itself. This morning, on a rolling basis, the S&P was at a new high. I guess when you add in today's data, it's not. But on a weekly chart, it's not quite there. Okay, Or even a daily chart, you can see. We're not too far away from all-time high, so if we measure that, let's see where we are. We're less than 1% away from all-time highs. So what did I just say? Well, when you're not too far from all-time highs, err on the side of the longer-term trend. For instance, let's just hop to the NASDAQ, and we'll come right back to the P's. What happened a couple days ago? Well, we had a big, fat, ugly reversal bar. And I'm sure the candle people, it's a, a little... A little baby fell out of a Samu, Samu, what do you call those wrestlers? What do you call the big fat wrestlers? <laughs> I don't know. I forget what they call them. Sumo, sumo, sumo wrestler. Why couldn't I think of that? Uh, a little baby got sat on by a sumo wrestler or whatever, and then look what happened the next day. went straight back up. So be careful not to get sucked into, and I'm picking on the candle people, but be careful not to get sucked into like a one bar pattern thinking that that's the end of the world or the market's going to change just because you have one bad bar. And then you see we reverse the next day, but then today, eh, getting a little iffy again, okay? But even though we're down, we are what? How far away from all time highs? Well, yesterday was all time high, so we know it was there. So right now we're 0.69% away from all-time highs. We're one good afternoon away from all-time highs. So what are we, what are we going to do? We're going to err on the side of the longer-term trend. Now, personally, I certainly would like to see this market break out decisively past this peak in here and not look back and do something like this. Oops. Do something like this. But so far, so good. It could always be better, right? S&P 500, as I just said, less than a percent away from all-time highs, especially if we take out yesterday's high and close there. So it's not the prettiest chart I've ever seen up until recently, if you're especially if you're connecting the highs. But up until recently, it's just kind of gone sideways in kind of a wide and loose fashion. But in more recent times, it's improved. And Russell 2000, still stuck in a little bit of a sideways range, as you can see. But how far away is it from all-time highs? And let's measure it. I'm glad you asked. So that's all-time highs. And yeah, we're less than three-quarters percent away from all-time highs. Russell 2000 could do that in one morning, okay? Now, some areas are a little choppy in here. The energies, they've improved a little bit as of late, but you can see kind of sideways. So unless you really, really like a setup, and I am seeing a couple setups in, 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 in the uh, energies. I don't know if I said 
indices, I meant energies. Um, unless you really like a setup, I wouldn't get too excited about them unless they go on to make new highs and stay there. Metals of mining look a little worse, although we did have a big gap up a few days ago. As you can see, I'm hearing that beep, beep noise of the electrocardiogram. Beep, 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 mostly sideways. So I would have to see the mother of all setups there. Financials, insurance, banks, not the prettiest charts in the world. But shorter term, you can see they have been improving. I wouldn't rush out and buy any banks right now. But this is one of the weak areas that has improved greatly. Along those lines, take a look at the transports. Looked a little dubious about three weeks ago. And now they're pushing up towards what? All-time highs, okay? So now it looks like we're back to giving them the benefit of the doubt. Less than 4% away from all-time highs. Drugs, not too far from all-time highs. Health services, banging out all-time highs. Software, new highs, and quite a few others in here. There's a few. It is a little mixed, okay? You can see semiconductors. Boy, I tell you, they've been a little wide and and sideways for a long time. I sure would like to see them get off their buttocks and go on to make new highs. But for the most part, things are generally improving, so you want to err on the side of longer-term trends. Take a look at bonds. You see bonds have been a little bit of a slide as of late. A little sideways and wide and loose, obviously. And as I've been saying quite a bit, as long as they can hold these major, major lows in here, I'm not going to get too excited about bonds. Now, I know I tend to obsess on the long end of the curve. Somebody last week was concerned or last show was concerned about the short end of the curve. I don't worry about that too much. And the reason is if you start worrying about that too much, you're going to end up with analysis paralysis. I just keep coming back to what is is and the best what is 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 the price so if the market's beginning to roll over yeah maybe the yield curve might be inverted maybe that's why maybe that's the problem but these things will be revealed to us after the fact and also if you're doing that that big economic analysis what's the old saying an economist will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday did not come true today I blurted that out to economists once, and I got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so hopefully there's not any economists here today. But, yeah, all that big picture, macroeconomics, that's fun. That's great. But you're going to have a long lag cycle. And as Greg says, Greg Morris, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So, yeah, the yield curve might invert, which means the market's going to tank in six months, but then the yield curve might go right back. So. Don't get too caught up in all that analysis paralysis. Kamada says, you're using arithmetic charts. Is arithmetic charts better than log charts? Um, I think that TC automatically converts to log charts. When you go longer term, you can see this is a log chart. And when you're shorter term, it automatically converts to arithmetic. So by default, I think my longer term charts are logarithmic and my shorter term charts are arithmetic. Okay. All right, let's go into get into individual stocks. TLRY for Mr. Donald. Well, that's an IPO. And what's my rule in IPOs? Five days, one, two, three, four, five. So they qualifies because it's been trading for one week. I would say yes. It looks kind of interesting. Okay. You got okay volume. You got pretty good range. So, yeah, I would say yes to that one. It could be a little volatile. Okay. It looks like it's got some volume in it, at least today. Let's check the volume a little closer. Yeah, you got pretty good volume. I would say that's okay. So, yeah, for sure. What a, that's a good way to start the show. Not bad at all. And John's also saying the same thing, TLRI. Good eye, John and Donald. Pan W. Okay, it, this is a – let's take a look at this a little longer term. Yeah, it's a little wide and loose in its uptrend. And then notice the HV is only 23. I don't know where the spiders are now. It, they've been pretty low. Well, they're at 9. 
But in general, you'll notice a lot of the stocks that I'm interested in, the HV is much higher, maybe 30, 40 or higher, within reason, of course. Once it gets triple digits, then it get kind of crazy. The other thing that kind of jumps out at me, if you look at this chart, you're like, oh, Dave, it looks like it's at a great uptrend. It's like, well, wait a minute. Where was it in May, and where is it now? Let's see if we can zoom in a little closer. It's like, yeah, it really hasn't gone up that much, okay? And one thing, as people have painfully discovered, such as Facebook, okay? I was looking at this this morning. HV is 20 on Facebook, which means low in volatility. Well, guess what? Something bad can still happen. By the way, the debacle de jour, there's your debacle de jour. So the pan W, a little wide and loose and not a solid trend. Yeah, it's going higher, but HV kind of low, just not worth it. Not worth it. BE. Well, this is only two days trading, so we don't know. So we could put this, we could certainly put this on our watch list, but there's nothing to do with it just yet. Okay. So I would hold off on that one for now. Okay, SQ. Um, with an IPO, I, well, hang on, that's not an IPO. Sorry about that. Um, Well, one thing I like to do is look at a prior peak and see how far past that prior peak we are. And we just kind of barely got past that prior peak. So I would look for something in a little bit more solid uptrend. Obviously, this stock in the past has had some pretty good runs, but now it's kind of wide and loose, even though it is trending. It's just, it's just gotten, it's just, it has become, is what I'm trying to say, more difficult to trade. So unless it broke out the new highs decisively and maybe looked to trade pullbacks along the way, I would hold off on that one. Kamano wants to talk about the dollar. Do you think the dollar will continue to go higher? Um, the problem with the dollar now is it's kind of sideways. As you can see, the trend is still up, but shorter term it has lost some steam. Take a look at the net net based on the UUP, and we've gone up quarter percent not even a quarter percent since when may so that's the only concern there longer term or somewhat longer term i should say still an uptrend over the short to intermediate term somewhat sideways in here okay but yeah still in an uptrend short cgc uh i'm seeing widened looseness happening here so you got this big, huge bar here. It kind of ran up, shot down, ran up, ran. It's kind of a Jackie Mason, Mason stock. Is that his name, Jackie Mason? I can't talk today. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. So I would pass based on that action. You know, maybe if it didn't have a couple of these crazy bars in here. Um, it's got an HV of 72. That's a little wild and crazy. Not that I wouldn't trade a stock at 72, but I would think twice. Definitely think twice before shorting a stock at 72 because they could come out with some announcement tomorrow and this stock could blow past your stop on the short side. A little dangerous. S-Fix, I like, Phil. I've been watching that one. It's been catching my eye. This is one that's a little wide and loose, okay? I'll give you that, but it is still an IPO. And IPOs, when they're making new highs, give them the benefit of the doubt, Okay. So that's not bad. Nice little pullback. I don't know if you, I don't know, remember if you're still in the service or not, but that is in the Landry list today. So good eye on that one, Phil. APA is going to be a commodity stock. Um, no, uh, unless you're going to short it, but I, I don't even see reason to short it. It's kind of wide and loose and it's kind of banging up against these tops and it's got a lot of overhead supply right here. So try to find something a little cleaner than that. And if this is your first time at the show, don't don't think I'm picking on you. I'm just showing you in reference to my methodology. If anything, you can see it's got a little thrust down. It's stalling out a little bit. It looks like it could be in trouble. So some guy's like, you know, you never like any of my stocks. I've been coming to your show for six months. It's like, well, pick better stocks. <laughs> 
But if you do the show, I understand. It's like, that's okay. We all have to learn somewhere. BJ for Phil. Well, that's going to be an IPO. It had an okay run in here. It's not bad. I mean, that's six points. Eh, what percentage is that? It's not going to be perfect, but it's 20% and change. It's not bad. It's okay. Um, I like to see a little bit more excitement in IPOs when they take off like this, but it's certainly not bad. Uh, definitely keep it on your watch list. So uh, good eye on that one, Phil, overall. B-C-E-I, B-C-E-I, appears to be breaking out of a long base going back over a year, emerging trend. All right, well, let's back it up. Um, yeah, it, I don't like the action way back here. But heck, if it went back to 100 bucks a share, I guess I'd be okay. Um, it's all right. Let it break out or keep breaking out, and then maybe look to play pullbacks along the way. Uh, the problem that you're going to have with a stock like this is that markets have really, really long memories. Okay, so what does happen? One reason I like the Phoenix stock, the the Phoenix type of setup, a, a bow tie after major, major lows when the market bottoms out for ideally months and maybe even years. One reason I like that setup is because a lot of the selling gets washed out. The market people unfortunately die. And when their estates get settled, they sell the stocks off. Um, people have to pay taxes over those periods. And sometimes a source of funds could be stocks. People might retire and need to just bail out. But even with all that supply that comes to the market that helps the bottoming process, markets still have really long memories. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of people still own a stock at 100 bucks a share. And as it begins to rally, they're going to sell into that rally, even though that was way back in 2017. So I would probably toss it out just based on that. And I would find something that's a little bit more cleaner and doesn't have any baggage. Kamada says, I tried many strategies, but your strategies make the most sense to me. Thank you for your help. Well, thank you, Kamada. I appreciate that. Are you a private trader still? Or you're uh, you working with a firm? What are you, what are you doing now? Well, we're waiting on that. John wants to talk about Kim. That's a blast from the past. I was looking at this one a couple days ago. This was one we got long, stayed long forever, got stopped out of. And then it did go back up. The problem is it didn't really take out this prior peak in here. So I hear you over the short to intermediate term. It looks okay, but it didn't take out the prior peak. And if we picked it apart a little bit, one problem I have, when a stock breaks out, I like to see it break out and then accelerate or at least accelerate in its breakout. In this particular case, it broke out and then it just drifted sideways before it had this little knockout in here. So that, on top of the fact that it really didn't clear its prior peak, I would not look to go long. Still trading. Good for you. Good for you. Where are you living? ABLR. Still in LA? Um, this is okay. It did shoot up. It doesn't fit the core methodology, but I kind of hear you as far as like IPOs. It did shoot up. And then it did have this kind of deep retracement. I, I, I'll give it an okay. Maybe put it on your watch list. It, it, wouldn't, it doesn't jump at me as something that I would go long. But sometimes in IPOs, you can have these deep retracements, and they can take off again. Southern California. Good for you. ABLR. ABLR. Oh, we just did that one. Okay, any more? Going once. While we're at an impasse, let's do this. O A L G N. Okay. Uh, the problem with this is let's let's draw our let's go back to the net net price change, and we go back to when June and so June thirteenth. So that's six weeks. What's that? A month. One month and two weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks of side. My brain's not working today. Six weeks of sideways action. Now, yeah, longer term, I hear you, it's still an uptrend, okay? But over the short to intermediate term, it's lost a lot of steam. So for me to get excited, it would have to break out nicely past this prior peak and then 
look to play some pullbacks along the way. Okay, any more? While we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming today. If there's anything unanswered, shoot me an email, and I'll try to get to it between now and next week. And if not, it will become fodder for next week's show. Go on once, go on twice. All right, well, thanks, everybody, again. Everybody have a fantastic a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.